So let's get started with solving from first principles. The first idea actually is to try to approximate the stable models of a logic program via a lower and an upper bound and then later on to try to tighten this, uh, these bounds as much as possible. But first of all the idea is to come up with lower and upper bounds as such. Actually this idea is not really new to you, at least to those of you who went through the grounding material, because there we had the atom base and the atom base, although we used it for grounding, constituted an upper bound, right? So this said these are all the atoms that are still possible to be derived. And then also we, we saw that there was a distinguished set of the true atoms in the atom base and these guys constituted the lower bound. So you already saw this idea of having a lower and an upper bound, though in grounding well, as we could, this was quite a part, but here the idea is to ultimately approximate the stable models that we only have a single stable model in between and then we pop it out and say, we found one. Anyway, the question is of course, how do we get these lower and upper bounds and how can we tighten them? And here the idea is again to work from first principles and with first principles I mean the definition of a stable model. And now you may wonder, oh, what can we do by linking these, these things? But well, let's play around a little bit with the definition and see what we can do. Oh well, as funny as it seems, uh, this may be a place where you may want to stop this video and actually check out another video. Because in class, actually, I use this break here to go to the blackboard and to develop a little bit the, the math that I'll be um, showing you on the remainder of this slide. And so, since I have no blackboard, I thought I'd create a blue board. And blue board is simply the, the combination of these blue slides with uh, some writing on the slides with a stylus. And again, you can, you can find this at teaching.potasco.org. And this is no advertisement, it's more or less where all this course material is, is bundled and then you can um, actually get a, perhaps a more detailed explanation to what I will be developing here on the slide next. So, now that you stopped the video, welcome back. So let's actually see a little bit what we can do uh, in terms of approxim approximating stable models. Looking at our approximation, we just see that actually it is based on subset relationships, right? So the lower bound is contained in any stable model and all the stable models are contained in the upper bound. Now since we want to develop our uh, algorithms from first principles, notably the definition of a stable model, it is interesting to look actually how uh, the reduct and the consequences of a reduct behave when we apply them to two sets that are contained in each other. So let's do this. And the first thing that we observe is if a set X is contained in a set Y, then the reduct is actually behaving anti-monotonically. So the reduct with a larger set is then actually contained in the reduct with a smaller set. So how that? Well, one thing, that, one thing to, to, to realize this is that since X is a subset of Y, all the rules that have been removed from P because, they, because of, of, of the negative body literals that appear in X, also appear in Y. But in Y there are even more atoms and hence uh, there's even more that has been removed. So hopefully this gives you an, an intuition actually why this happens. Now once we have um, two reducts that are contained in each other, we can apply the consequence operator and now I mean the consequences of a positive logic program. And this guy is monotonic, so actually if we have a smaller input uh, than another, we also get less consequences with a smaller input <coughs> excuse me, than we get from the larger input. So here the consequence uh, operation on positive logic programs behaves monotonically. Okay, the question is, what can we now do with these insights? A lot is actually the answer. This is more or less the key observation for tightening approximations. But let's look at it step by step. Now, if we take stable model, and again, it's important that now our X is a stable model of a, uh, of a normal logic program, because we will actually be exploiting its definition now. Okay, then, first thing we, we know from our, from our, more or less our prerequisite, right? This is what we are given here, that the lower bound is a subset of the stable model that we picked now. Okay. Now by applying 
our observation, this implies that the consequences of the reduct with a stable model are a subset of the consequences um, of the reduct with a lower bound. Okay, this is just applying the, uh, this observation here. If this is the case, it implies that this holds. Okay, hmm, okay, now so far nothing big, but now the clue comes in. We actually know that X is a stable model, hence we can replace the consequences of the program with, the, with, with X by X itself, and we get this relationship. Okay, well, actually the same can be done with the upper bound. And once we are through, we will see actually how we can tie this together, so stay tuned on that. Okay, with the upper bound it's the same, we know, just the other way around, we know that the stable model is contained in the upper bound. And now we can apply the observation that we did and we conclude that the consequences of the program reduced with the upper bound is a subset of the consequences of the program reduced with x. That's more or less, again, everything is just turned around to the case that we did before. And again, we can do the same trick. Since we, since we know that x is a stable model, we actually know that this expression here is equivalent to x. Hence, we can replace it. And here we go. And now things really start to, to become interesting. Because originally we knew that the lower bound is in x. But now, given, that, given this relation here, that x is also in the upper bound, we additionally deduce that the consequences of the program reduced by the upper bound is also in x. And there's yet another observa observation to be made. So we know, we saw here, again, this is what we, what, what we have originally, that x is a subset of the upper bound. But now we also learn that x must be a subset of the consequences of the program reduced with a lower bound. And this is the, we can now tie this together to strengthen our approximation. So let's do this again, step by step. Now this is what we are given, right? The lower bound is contained in the stable model and the stable model is contained in the upper bound. Now, again, knowing that the lower bound uh, is in x, and that also the consequences of the program reduced with the upper bound is in x, both of them must be in x, and that's the relation that we get. And this now tightens the, the lower bound by adding more elements to the lower bound. So now not only the lower bound is contained in x, but also um, the atoms that we get from the consequences of the program reduced with the upper bound. And a similar, the similar observation now is that we, we, of course, we know that x is a subset of the upper bound, but in addition, we know that x is also a sub subset of the consequences of the program is reduced with the lower bound. So x, x is now contained in both, in the upper bound and in these consequences here. Hence, it must also be contained in the intersection. And again, we tightened the upper bound because now we remove uh, elements and we restrict the upper bound to the consequences of the program with respect to the lower bound. And so here we extend the lower bound and here we decrease the upper bound and we get a tighter approximation. And this is the key idea that will actually now lead us to our first algorithmic structure that allows us to approximate step by step um, the stable models of a logic program. Now the obvious emerging algorithmic idea that we get from this is that we start with a lower and an upper bound and with each iteration we try to make it smaller and smaller until we can't uh, tighten things more, right? And this is here explained in this algorithm, so we more or less repeat uh, the, the, the inner part of the loop until the lower and upper bound do not change anymore and at each step we replace the, the, lo the former lower bound by the uh, with the, lower, with the former lower bound union with the consequence of the program reduced by the upper bound and in, analogously we replace the former upper bound by the former upper bound intersected with the consequences um, of the program reduced by the lower bound. Now and in this way what we, must, we can tighten uh, iteratively our approximation until, uh, until we can't tighten it anymore. So, again we can make some observations here, so of which I think is pretty obvious at each step um, the approximation gets tighter, so the lower bound becomes larger or stays the same, and the upper bound becomes smaller or stays the same. And as an invariant, we actually have that 
We can tighten the lower and the upper bound, but we will never lose stable models. Whereas all the stable models that we had initially will remain there even though we tighten the bounds. Right? This is an invariant of, 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 of this uh, loop here. Then there are also some special cases. And the first special case is in case we more or less went with the lower bound over the upper bound, right? that the lower bound is not contained in the upper bound again, then this, in, this indicates an, an inconsistency and the program that we have at hand has no stable model. And the second special case is when the lower and the upper bound coincide, then actually at that point what we found there is a stable model and the lower or the upper bound, depending on which one you prefer, because they are identical, constitute a stable model. And these are already the basic ingredients now for what we call a propagation algorithm. And propagation means you have a program and you want to, to compute deterministically uh, the truth values of variables as far as you can take it. Okay, let's look at this algorithm now. So, here it is. I call it expand, not only because it expands the true and false atom that we gather about our normal logic program, but also because the propagation uh, procedure of the very first ASP server S models shared the same name. So anyway, what, the, what it does is basically following the, it, the iteration that we sketched before with a few exceptions. Okay, first of all, what do we have? We have our normal logic program, which is given as a parameter because it doesn't change at all. And then we have a lower and an upper bound. And initially, when you call the procedure, of course, you call it with the empty set and the set of all atoms, the alphabet. Okay, then you loop until you have a fixed point. And a fixed point means that your lower and upper bound do not change anymore. For this, to this end, you have a, an auxiliary, two auxiliary variables, L prime and U prime, that capture the, the, the lower and the upper bound resulting from the previous iteration. And once these two guys do not uh, differ anymore, then you reach the fixed point. Okay. Otherwise, you then compute the new lower and upper bound just in the way that, that we uh, uh, sketched it before, right? You take the old lower bound, you unit it with the consequences of the program reduced with the old upper bound, and the new upper bound is the old upper bound intersect with the consequences of the program reduced with the old lower bound. The additional part here is, is this uh, uh, conditional here, where we actually check whether the lower and the upper bound have, um, have more or less uh, went, went over each other, and the lower bound is not contained in the upper bound again. This indicates actually a conflict so there is actually, we, we, we started to uh, converge the lower and the upper bound, and since they went more or less, they passed by each other, this means there was not even a stable model in between, and this indicates a failure. And then in case this procedure was called from a backtracking procedure, as it will be, as we will see next, then we have to backtrack, and in this way, the, our expand algorithm detects an inconsistency that in case it, 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 it finds it, right, that there is actually no stable model between the lower and the upper bound that is given. Okay, so this is more or less the procedure. I guess given that we, were, we derived it from the first principles and looked at the algorithmic idea and now putting it back into an algorithm, things look <clears throat> pretty obvious, but not clear, right? And that's actually why we do now an example. So this is actually the same example as I used on the blue board, which I mentioned before. And before we now enter the trace of the algorithm, let's actually first look a little bit at this, at this uh, program and see what we can expect, right? So first thing actually that we notice is that A is a fact. So if, we have a, if our expand procedure is good, it should actually detect that A must be true and belong to the lower bound. Okay, in the same way, actually looking at the heads of all the rules, we see that we can. there is no rule that gives us C. So C cannot be derived, and by closed world reasoning, C must be false. And again, if our expand algorithm is smart, it should detect it and remove it from the upper bound, from the possible atoms, and thus to make it false. Now, I think these are the obvious things that one can, um, one can uh, um, observe looking at the, at the program. 
The next thing actually to look at is once we convinced ourselves that A must be true and C must be false, then we notice actually that the second rule must apply, hence B must be true as well. Hence again, our expand procedure, if it is smart, it should be able to detect that both A and B should be true and should belong to the lower bound. Now for the remaining rules, again, keep in mind, if we find out that B is true, the two remaining rules here form a so-called even loop, right? So B depends negatively on E and E depends negatively on D, so they form an even loop. And even loops induce normally alternative stable models. You may remember the exemplars that we looked at in the introductory section where we discussed this a little bit. And there actually the, our approximation um, a procedure cannot really do anything because it cannot really resolve the conflict between D and E. It can only more or less approximate the two stable models that are somehow inherent in this stable model. Okay, now let's get to work. So this is the trace that we look at and this is now the first, the first step and initially actually the, the lower bound we take the empty set and as an upper bound we take the set of all atoms and these are five, right? A, B, C, D, E. And now we, we, we continue and the first thing that we need to do is we need to, to, to build the reduct. On, on the left hand side here we build the reduct with respect to the initial upper bound, that's that guy. And on the right hand side we build the reduct with the empty set with, which is the previous lower bound which is this guy. Okay, now let's first look at, at this side here. So if we do the reduct and we assume actually that A, B, C, D and E are somehow true, right? Then we remove all the rules that have negative or that contain these atoms as negative body literals. So here we go and we're left with a single fact, namely A. Then the consequences of this program of the reduct of P with, a, with this large upper bound is given here and this is simply A. Okay, good. Now let's look to the other side and let's reduce the program with the with the empty set, so, so, to, so to say, uh, assuming that nothing is true. And if nothing is true, somehow, then we can still more or less use all the rules by just dropping all the negative uh, prerequisites or the negative body literals and see what is maximally derivable. Okay, let's do that. We do the reduct, we eliminate all the negative uh, uh, body literals since none of them can be contained in the empty set, right? And now we get a, a program that allows us to derive A and B, and from B we get D and E. So more or less what we, what we get is A, B, D and E, but we cannot get C. There's no way to get C and we detect it at that moment. And that's pretty cool. So in a way now, if we calculate the new lower bound by unioning the old lower bound with, with the, the consequences of the reduced program, so we, we put those together, we get A. So our approximation procedure, our expand procedure already detected that A must be true, A must belong to the lower bound. And in the same way, by intersecting here the, the former upper bound with the consequences of, of this reduct here, we already detect that C cannot be true, right? So C has already been removed because there's no way to derive C. So, and these were also the first straightforward observations that we made when looking at the example. Okay, now let's go in the second iteration. So now we get, we have a new lower bound and a new upper bound. <clears throat> and we do the same thing again. Now we reduce the programs with the uh, tightened uh, upper bound and the increased uh, lower bound. Now if we do this, we get here actually an additional rule because C is not contained here. So now we can derive A and B. So these are now the consequences of the program reduced with this new upper bound, what we got here. And here nothing really changed because since A is not among the negative uh, body literals, reducing by A does not really change and we get the same conclusions here again. And now, uh, again, computing the new lower and upper bound, we get a tighter lower bound because now actually we can, we added A and B to the lower bound and we, we were able to, to, to determine just by, by approximation, by calculation that A must be true and B must be true. And again, B took one iteration more, and I think this was also clear actually by the motivation uh, I tried to give you at the beginning on the example. Well, on the upper bound, actually nothing changed, all stayed the same. And the, that nothing changes anymore actually will also be the case on the third 
iteration where we that we enter now with, a, with, with, with the with the increased lower bound and, and the, well, the identical upper bound that we had before. We do the same procedure, we calculate, we try to strengthen it, but nothing happens. We get fixed points and the result will be A and B as a lower bound and uh, A, B, D, E uh, as an upper bound. And keep in mind, so here the idea is this set does not include C, hence C must be false. And this is then also, the, if you like, the conclusion we can draw by running our expand procedure on this program here, initially with the empty set and the set of all atoms. So we get that for every stable model X of P, A and B must be contained in it, and C uh, uh, cannot be contained in any of them. And this is more or less the approximation that we get. And the, in this way, we cannot, decide, uh, the, the re we cannot decide D and E. They remain open for us. And we will see later on actually how we can deal with that. Okay, now this is our example. Let's just wrap up on and give briefly the properties of our expand procedures. Of our expand procedure. There's only one, the ultimate one. Here, just to wrap up the part on the expand algorithm or our approximation driven propagation procedure, just to throw in all the buzzwords. So, here are a few things to remember, right? So, first of all, it tightens the approximation on stable models. So it, it really, you, you may have a few stable models in between and it only tightens the lower and the upper bound, but it never actually destroys any of them. Hence it's stable model preserving. And the question now is, if you want to use this procedure to calculate actually stable models, what, how, what do we do if we end up with a, with, with a fixed point? And how can we then calculate the stable models in between? And here the thing is, well, the ground truth is we cannot compute the truth value of the remaining atoms with, a, with, with propagation, not with the, not, in particular not with, not with the expand algorithm. So the only thing that uh, we can do is we can just pick an atom that we could not assign a truth value before and do a case analysis on this guy, right? So we actually we, we pick an atom like D, as we will do on the next slide, then assume it to be true, then launch again our propagation mechanism. If we find a stable model, we, we uh, output it. And if not, we do the converse. We say that D is actually false. And then we look for a stable model in this half by applying the, pro the propagation algorithm. And that's more or less the idea. Actually, the idea of the very basic al search algorithm of the first ASP system S models that is backtracking based and does exactly that, right? You propagate. And then you stop when you cannot propagate anymore. Then you look at, well, either if you're lucky, actually, you've got a stable model or you found an inconsistency. But otherwise, uh, you, you find yourself with, a, with atoms that you could not determine a truth value for. And then you just pick one, do a case analysis. You take this atom, assume that it's true, assume that it's false, and continue this procedure recursively. And this was, again, a lot of hand-waving. And forgive me about that, but I thought it's better to explain a bit the intuition before we actually now go on by applying these ideas. Okay, so, what can I say? Stay tuned. Now, once our expand algorithm terminates in its initial run on our example, it's all about choices. So we figured out that A and B belong to the lower bound and A, B, D and E belong to the upper bound. That is, A and B must be true. C must be false, and D and E are possible. They may be true, they may be false. So by running our expand algorithm to a fixed bound, we have this lower and upper bound. And the only thing we know that there is an arbitrary number of stable models in between. And now the idea is, well, since we cannot compute anymore, let's divide up the set of stable models among the lower and the upper bound. And the way to do this is now just to pick an atom and say, okay, now I look at all the stable models where this atom is in, and then I look at all the stable models that do not contain this atom, so that make it false. And actually, we can do the very same thing here. And I, I now have the choice between making a case analysis on D or on E, and I choose D. You may choose E just for an exercise. Anyway, what I do now first, I expand by making D true. And making D true means here I add it to the lower bound. Nothing has to be done on the upper bound because 
A, B, and D are contained in that. So that's all cool. Okay, now, again, we ran our expand procedure up to termination, up to having a fixed point on the lower and the upper bound. Now I make a choice and now I say, okay, D should be true. I add it and now I launch the expand procedure again. Now in doing that, I take the lower bound here and the upper bound here. And again, keep in mind that now I made D true. I decided that. And now we can launch the whole procedure again, right? We can uh, reduce with the new upper bound and compute the consequences and the same here with the lower bound. And here we get A and B. And here we get A, B and D. And keep in mind here we union both. We union the, the lower bound and the consequences of the program reduced by the upper bound. And here we uh, do the intersection. And in both cases we get in this little small example A, B and D. So we get already the same result. The lower and the upper bound coincide. So we launch we don't detect that at that point now, we, because again, the former upper bound and the now obtained uh, new upper bound are different, so we launch the procedure again. But now actually we figure out that the lower and the upper bound are the same, our expand procedure terminates, and we obtain A, B and D as a stable model of our program. Okay, now I made this choice, and we were lucky actually that we found a stable model. Let's actually see what happens in the other search. The search actually where we say uh, that D should be false. So we have to choose the complement because by choosing the complement we have exhausted the search space where we, we made D true and now D is false. So we divided the set of stable models in two, the ones containing D and the ones not containing D. And now we look at the ones not containing D. Again, our expand procedure terminated and now expanding with not D, which is a bit sloppy to say, simply means I remove D from the upper bound and by removing D from the upper bound I say it's impossible and hence it must be false. Same thing as before, we now launch our expand procedure again, now with the new, the new lower bound and the new upper bound. We calculate the consequences of the reduced programs here we, use, we union both of them, here we intersect, and again, in this nice cozy example, we get the same set, A, B, and E, as a new lower bound and as a new upper bound. And again, here we had a change in the lower bound, so we have to do another, another round trip, so we launch our procedure again, and now actually the lower and the upper bound coincide, we get A, B, and E as a second stable model. And that's it. These are the two stable models that we got. And I think now you already got the idea a little bit and let's just put all this together now in our first algorithm that allows us to compute the stable models of a logic program. So here it is, our very first algorithm for computing the stable models of a logic program. As with the expand algorithm we have the program here as a as a parameter since it doesn't change and we have a lower and an upper bound. And you can imagine that initially you call this procedure with the empty set as the lower bound and the set of all atoms as the upper bound and then things more or less go their way as we've seen in the previous examples. Okay, let's just detail this a little bit. Good, so first of all, the first step that we do is propagation, right? So we take the program along with the, with the lower and upper bound that we received and we try to tighten this lower bound as much as possible. And then when we, it, it is more or less as tight as, as, as it gets at that point, we do a case analysis. And there are three cases. First case is, well, the lower and the upper bound pass by each other. So there is actually no stable model in between. This indicates failure. We backtrack and that's it, right? Second case, oh, they hit. The lower and the upper bound are the same. Then actually we found a stable model and we just output. The lower or the upper bound, they're identical, doesn't matter. Third case, means, again, third case means we have not had a conflict, so we are not yet, the, the lower and the upper didn't pass by and they don't hit, so there is space in between. That's very important, right, to note. And this space in between, these are just atoms for which we couldn't determine the truth value. They are neither true nor false, they are merely possible, right? So what we then have to do is the case and is the case and so divide the search space, divide the set of stable models that are between the lower and the upper bound in two. And so we pick an atom, so we pick an atom that is between the lower and the upper bound, a possible atom. And then we call the whole procedure recursively once, 
by assuming that this atom here is true. In case we found a stable model, great, then we can output it. Otherwise, we check the second case where this stable model is false and here we eliminate it from the upper bound. And well, you can of course go through both alternatives and simply enumerate the stable models in this way. So this is a very simple but very successful uh, procedure to solve uh, logic problems and compute their stable models. And actually, those of you who are familiar with constraint satisfaction algorithms, this is the basic skeleton of such, of, of, such a, of such an algorithm where the idea is you propagate, you try to calculate as many truth values or values for variables as possible, then well, when, when, when you can't assign any, any, any truth values anymore, you do a case analysis, you have three cases, either uh, you have to backtrack because you got a conflict or you found a solution or then with the remaining on the remaining variables you do a case analysis and continue recursively. So that's our first algorithm and I hope you liked it as much as I did developing it. Let's just wrap up and again summarize a bit the properties of this algorithm on the, on the next slide. Stay with me. As before with the expand procedure, the algorithmic skeleton that we have just looked at is more or less a blueprint for the very first ASP solver S models developed at the university or the Technical University of Helsinki at the time, which is now called Alto University, ZIP. And it is inspired actually by a classic procedure called the Davis, Putnam, Logman and Lovman procedure, which is used to compute the classical models of propositional formulas. And it's more or less the same style of procedure, just with another semantics in, in mind. And the semantics, of course, is um, encoded in the expand, in the propagation uh, function. Right? All the rest is more or less a search algorithm that is pretty standard, that follows, as I mentioned before, uh, what, what, what one knows from constraint satisfaction, and in particular, in the, the DPLL procedure. Anyway, this is something for you to consult Wikipedia on, perhaps. Or some of you actually know it, and then they have a point of reference. So what did, we, what did we see? It's more or less a backtracking search based algorithm and it builds a binary search tree, right? So whenever it, 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 it propagates, then it has to do a case analysis and then it propagates in both and then it does a case analysis. And more or less, whenever a case analysis happens, this is actually a source of complexity because keep in mind you get a search tree and this has, of course, exponential size. Good. So any node actually where, where, where the algorithm branches can be interpreted as a partial or a three-valued interpretation with the idea that the lower bound gives you the true elements and everything not in the upper bound gives you the false ones and well the ones that are possible but not true are undefined. Right? So this is more or less the idea. And of course search is something well if you have a good navigator your search can be much can be much quicker than without a good navigator. And here the two factors are more or less how powerful is your propagation method, that is the expand procedure. And actually the expand procedure is pretty powerful as we will see later on when we look at, at, the, at, the, at the more detailed uh, algorithmic framework for doing propagation. And the, of course the other thing is choices. If you make good choices your search space may be much smaller than if you make bad choices. But you never know, right? You'd only know afterwards, not when you make them. And last but not least, this is perhaps a nitpicking detail, the choices are made on atoms. And we will see later on that one actually may consider making choices on more complex formulas, more complex entities, and this may even help accelerating search. Just something to remark because I will definitely refer back to this point later on. Okay, then that's, that's it. That concludes our part on solving from first principles. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I was quite excited about that part and I hope you liked it too, because it really derived an algorithm from the definition of a stable model. And again, the definition of fixed point and all that, that is a bit clumsy to begin with, right? But I think we, it nicely actually translates into, in, into an algorithm and I hope actually that you share some of the excitement that I, I, I tried, that, that I had while, while explaining it to you. Okay, now let's, think, let's wrap things up and look uh, at uh, the complexity of logic programs and uh, see actually how complex the problem actually is that we are about to solve.